sleeping a lot during the day helps. Sure. So if you, if you can take away a moral from a sloth, be your inner sloth. That means conserve energy, live life in the slow lane, live longer, right? Right. That's, that's essentially what they do. Excellence at Work is sponsored by Youngstown State University. What I am is a morphologist. I'm, I'm what is known as a functional morphologist or a biomechanist. And what interests me is the structure and the function of animals. Essentially, how they're put together and how do they work. And our frame of reference for the ways in which animals move, it's upright. You and me, we're upright bipeds. Mm -hmm. uh, we walk standing tall and vertical. Our limbs are beneath us. It allows us to move quite efficiently or economically in walking. And we're, we're decent at running, although by no means are we evolved or specialized to be good runners because it's very energetically costly for us to do that, as it is for a lot of other mammals. But quadrupeds have it over us in that regard. They can be much more economical at running, and some are quite specialized for it, like a horse or a species of cheetah fast versus long distance running. Our dogs, which are domesticated wolves, are well known for their tracking abilities. They can run down prey over very long distances and ultimately they're hoping to be successful at capturing that prey and, and gaining from their resources. So these are the basic ideas where I started. I was interested predominantly in quadrupeds that were runners or they were jumpers. And then as my career evolved from my graduate student days to my postdoctoral days to my faculty professor days, I wanted to do something a little bit different to address animals that were a bit more underrepresented in the literature as far as understanding their functional anatomy. So I started focusing on animals that were specialized to either dig or climb and or engage in this behavior that we call suspension. And mm -hmm. suspension means that they're operating below a branch. Right. Okay. So I, I'll put the diggers aside because that's really not what you're interviewing me about. But my initial foray into suspension came from opossums. Now, it's an animal that you would probably mistakenly call a possum, which is a slang word for opossum, okay. right? Uh, there are 108 <laughs> species of them, Mike. And they're predominantly in South America, but they are the didelphid marsupials of the Americas. Remember at one point, Australia and South America physically were in contact with one another. And we think of the marsupials as being endemic to Australia. Like that's where they live in New Guinea, Australia, Tasmania. But there's also <coughs> the, the didelphids, the opossums, <coughs> which inhabit the Americas. So the one and only opossum that we have in this country, which is called the Virginia opossum, as its common name, um, it's native to South America. Pretty interesting. So they have notably a tail, which is called a prehensile tail. And it allows them to engage in suspension in tree branches. Some opossums can do it better than others because their tail is a bit stronger relative to their body size. By the time that one of the opossums in your backyard gets to be an adult, you know, they get quite big because they live off of our rubbish. They, their tail is not strong enough to support their massive body weight, so they lose that ability. So this idea to grip and grasp and hang and suspend, that got me interested in this idea of suspension. And so when an opportunity came around in 2015, where I had already been to Costa Rica twice before doing work with opossums, some of the other species that are found throughout the Central and South America regions, I was given an opportunity by a wildlife veteran that I befriended who had helped me collaborate on an opossum project. And he asked me, since I'm an anatomist and a functional one of that, would you be interested in collaborating with a colleague of mine on a project with sloths? And to be quite fair, Mike, I had never really thought much about a sloth before, before then, aside right. from teaching about them in my lecture. Most people I don't. <laughs> I, I wasn't like, wow, I absolutely have to make my career about studying sloths. Yeah. And, and I still don't. They're a fascinating model, and, and I'll get to that part of why they're a model of study. Uh, but I said yes. And the basic question was, how are these animals so strong? And I think a, a good point of reference for us as humans would be, 
What if I were to ask you, Mike, here's a pull-up bar. I want you to jump up and I want you to hang for as long as you possibly can. How long do you think you would last on that bar? Probably less than a minute. I actually okay. was trying this the other day. Okay. I, I so work out fairly regularly. I am not in good shape. Okay. But you know what I mean? I'm not like a couch potato either. Sure. Sure. And my daughter was at the playground and they had the bars or whatever. I don't ever do pull-ups. And I just went and I, this is really, really hard. It was surprisingly hard. <laughs> it is. So yeah. I, I love to do pull-ups, by the way. It's, it's one of my go-to exercises. Sure. And, you know, I've been to numerous places in Europe, and whenever we go, there always seems to be, like, the carnival barker guy who has the pull-up bar set up. And they're hoping that, you know, some tourists will cough up 10 or 15 euros, and they're going to they're gonna beat the record, right? They're going to hang for longer than a minute, which is what you have to do. No one ever does. Most right. people will last between 20 and 40 seconds. Now, you can adjust multiple ways whilst you're on the bar to try to hang on a little bit longer. But what you do is you're trying to take the emphasis off of your, your, your gripping muscles, your digital flexors, and you're trying to put it more on your elbow flexors or your shoulder flexors. And slots are pretty ingenious. They, they naturally do this. But the thing that will fail on you before the other is your grip strength. That's, that's going to be the limiting factor for you. Mm -hmm. So this is why people who climb rocks or who climb mountains, these are usually pretty thin, wiry individuals, but they have remarkable grip strength. Think of these ninja warrior types. Right. It's always the mountain climbers that they are the best. So what does a sloth have in that regard? And this is really the question that my colleague Becky at the time asked me. How are they so strong? And I said, okay, well, give me an idea of how strong you think they are. I mean, is it just a matter of, of gripping onto tree branches and hanging? Because I know that's difficult by being a person who enjoys doing pull-ups. Your grip strength will give out on you. And she told me, if a sloth could shake your hand, it would crush it. Really? And, wow. They're that strong. So... We set out to do a series of anatomical studies. Whenever we're addressing questions like this, Mike, we always start with the anatomy. How are they put together? And then from there, I can figure out how does the system work? So we did these detailed dissections on their entire forelimb musculature, what, what you might call an arm, including their, their forefeet, their hands. And then we did it on the hind limbs. And we were looking for properties of the muscles that would indicate to me how they could be so strong. Well, we found a couple of interesting things that certainly were related to their ability to grip and grasp. And then we had to go one step further. I needed to know the physiology of the muscle fibers. Now, when you look at a sloth, their muscles present as very dark red. Think of beef, Mike. Mm -hmm. When you go to a grocery store, you see beef, it's notably red in color, and then when you cook it, it turns brown. So that's, it's an oxidized form of the meat now, the proteins have been oxidized, they become brown. We typically think of that as slow twitch muscle, whereas a chicken breast looks pink at the grocery store, and when you cook it, it turns white. That's how it oxidizes, and we think of that as fast twitch muscle. So the sloths are notably the opposite of a chicken breast. They are dark, dark red. Okay. Counts. Like the, the average person would look at that and think, that is really slow contracting muscle. These animals must be highly aerobic, right? They're a lot of oxygen and, and they can just hang and hang and hang for long periods of time. Well, that, that's a very reasonable hypothesis. We had the same one. They're probably aerobic or oxidative, slow twitch type of muscles. So we did the study. And what we learned was sloths actually have both slow and fast twitch muscles. And as you go from the shoulder to the elbow to the wrist to the hand, or the hip to the knee to the ankle to the foot, the muscles become progressively faster contracting in their contractile properties. But not to the point where it's a majority, say 60% fast twitch, 40% slow twitch, with the exception of the forelimb digital flexors. Now, you might otherwise think, well, that means they're powerful. It, it doesn't mean that, actually. Sloths are not really powerful at all, but they're strong. So we did a little further right. probing. Once we, once we learned about the distribution of slow twitch and fast twitch, we decided to analyze, are they aerobic? Are they anaerobic? 
do they rely mostly on oxygen or do they rely on the same type of systems that we do when we're doing weightlifting, which is all anaerobic type of muscle metabolism. This was the most surprising result. They're anaerobic. These animals are the ultimate weightlifters. So think of how we do weightlifting. You're, you said you're a gym guy. You go in, you, you have a, a routine, you do a set, maybe 10 reps, you take a break, you recover. Then you do it again. You take a break, you recover, then you do it again. Well, if we connect two things, the movement patterns of sloths and their muscle physiology, we find a direct relationship. The animals move in a very slow, deliberate, intermittent way. They, they right. rarely move consistently or consecutively stride after stride after stride. So essentially they're doing <clears throat> sets and reps and they're taking breaks in between. When we do that in the gym, it's all anaerobic. Unless you're doing cardio where you're getting your heart rate up and you're keeping it elevated for long periods of time, your body doesn't need an energy system that relies on oxygen to make a lot of what we call ATP, which is the energy substrate that all of our cells run on. Sloths require little of that because of their intermittent movement patterns, and it's quite ingenious because it's a way in which they save energy. And that's what a sloth must do. It has to move in a way that relates to its muscle physiology, that relates to its overall body physiology, low body temperature, low metabolic rate, because it has an energy poor diet. Most sloths eat leaves. I don't know if you enjoy eating leaves, but if you no. had to subsist yourself on lettuce, you're not going to make it very far. Right. Because, because it has very little calories and little nutritional value. And then think about all the waxy cuticle on leaves. We can't digest that. That's called cellulose. That's what we think of as fiber. They're getting a lot of fiber in their diet, but they have a way to deal with it. Their stomach is a big fermentation chamber. So like a cow that has a ruminant system, they ferment their food over weeks, Mike. So it takes about three weeks for a sloth to digest one meal of leaves. Three weeks. So they don't often go to defecate, but more than about once every seven to ten days. They will descend a tree to do that, on average about once a week. But if you're taking that long to digest a meal, it makes sense why they don't have to remove that waste that frequently. So we started thinking about this in a very holistic way. It started off as, well, how are they so strong? Well, I think we answered right. that question pretty well. And, and when I did the back of the envelope calculations, I reckon that a sloth is roughly two times stronger than the average human when you compare muscle to muscle and the muscle's ability to make force and to generate torque. They can outdo a human by nearly two times. And the muscles in particular that are really strong are these digital flexors at the end of their limbs, which directly allow them to flex their digits. And that's what they're gripping onto the tree branch with. Well, then our next thought was, okay, well, can we quantify what their grip strength is? And so recently we set out to do that. This paper is actually in review right now at the Journal of Zoology. And in terms of percentage of body weight, how much, with respect to a human, how much do you think that a human can grip relative to its body weight? What percentage of its body weight would be equivalent to a grip strength of the average human? What would you think? Uh, Off their body 20%. Weight? Okay, so you'd say 20%. Uh, yeah, I have right out of the, a wild guess. No problem. Yeah. You're actually at the low end of the range. Okay. So about 20 to 40% would be something typical for human grip strength. Other primates which are related to us, like um, a squirrel monkey, a tamarind, a macaque, they're a bit higher actually. They're between roughly 50 and 70%. What do you think the relative grip strength of a, a three-toed sloth is? Well, it's got to be more than its body weight, right? It is actually equivalent to its body weight or slightly greater. Okay. Yeah. Right? Now, remember, Mike, these are only the muscles at the end of the limb, it, it, not the ones that flex the elbow or that flex the shoulder and allow the animal to do a pull-up, just the ones that flex the digits that allow it to grip 
the tree branch. Right, That's it. right. Those muscles by themselves are capable of supporting the entire body weight of the animal. That's yeah. remarkable. That's crazy. And that doesn't even account for other properties that we've since measured. For example, the tendons that attach the muscle to the digits, to the bones of the, of the digits. Those tendons are actually, they, they look like they would be a lot stronger than they are. So I wish I could tell you that their tendons are remarkably strong as well. But as it turns out, they don't need to be. Their tendons are actually a bit stretchier than we thought. We call that compliance. But that compliance is important because it allows them to stretch just enough where they could actually support the entire body weight of the animal without any muscles being attached to them. And they could do it multiple times their body weight. We call that a safety factor. So the for, for one limb, just imagine the animal's hanging off the pull-up bar just by its right arm. The safety factor there, as we call it, would be about two to three. That means that just the tendons by themselves and their ability to stretch and resist the stretch could support three times the body weight of the animal with one limb and one series of tendons. And yet sloths rarely just hang by one limb. They're mm -hmm. most often in contact with the branch by three or four limbs. So that number goes up in multiples and it reaches a, a, a high mark of roughly about 15 times the body weight of the animal. Mike, that's with no muscular contraction. That's just the property right. of the tendons themselves. But the fact that muscles are always connected to tendons, and that's how the muscles are able to make the digits flex to actually move the joint. The muscles have an ability to what we call modulate the stiffness of those tendons. So by a low level of contraction, the muscle can pull on the tendon, and then as the body weight is stretching the tendon, it makes the tendon more resistant to being stretched, so it doesn't stretch quite as much. And that is what we call stiffness. And so muscles modulate the stiffness of a tendon. And this is pretty interesting because as we think about their need to conserve energy, this is a, a brilliant system. If they're just hanging, they're not walking, they're not climbing, just hanging, they can rely largely on passive support by their tendons in a low level of muscle activity in the way of contraction just to keep those tendons at the appropriate stiffness to support their body weight without the need of any other musculature. So I'm, I'm just kind of visualizing or imagining myself hanging by a pole mm -hmm. by one arm. Right. You know, and, and I'm, I'm kind of just saying, yeah, forget your grip, forget your hand, you know, that right. you wouldn't be able to do it. Right. I'm just imagining the pain that I'm going to start feeling in the shoulder. my joints and my shoulder and the yeah. shoulder. So, so that's a great question. I often get asked the same type of question. The shoulder joints of sloths are quite mobile. In fact, they're more mobile than yours. So this is a really important point. The ability of the digital flexors to maintain this large level of grip strength and the ability of the elbow flexors, the biceps, the brachialis, another muscle called the brachioradialis, very important to suspension are flexor muscles in general knee flexors like hamstrings, elbow flexors like biceps. Because when you're below a branch, it's the flexor musculature that has to support the body weight, not the extensor musculature. You and me are the opposite. We're upright, or, or any mammal for that matter that's not a suspensory one. We rely on our quadriceps, you know your quads, their knee extensors. We rely on our triceps, back of the arm. If we were in a quadrupedal position, the quadriceps and the triceps would be critical muscles to help keep our joints straight to support our body weight. But sloths and other suspensory animals like um, a loris, a primate that goes below branch and walks below branch, they, they essentially do a pull-up, Mike. They pull their, their torso up closer to the tree branch and they support their body mass by the flexor musculature. And do you know why they do that? By, by doing a pull-up, they get more horizontal. And if you can make your elbow joint a 90-degree angle or your knee joint closer to a 90-degree angle, the flexor muscles that operate that joint, it improves their mechanical advantage. 
And I don't think that the sure. idea of mechanical advantage is something that's lost on many people. So by having a nearly 90 degree angle, that's the optimal angle for flexors to keep the joint flexed. And they can do it with relatively less muscle force because of the in-lever, out-lever relationship. And that's the whole idea that we think of as mechanical advantage. So sloths intuitively do this. Lorises intuitively do this. Howler monkeys intuitively do this. They, they pull up and they get their joints closer to 90 degrees. And that means the muscles don't have to use as much energy for contraction to make force to keep their body weight supported. So even aside from those, if it were just the grip force muscles, and then you factor in the elbow flexors or the knee flexors, do you know what that does? It takes the loading off of the shoulder. It takes the loading off of the hip, which are mobile as arboreal mammals tend to be because they reach and they climb and they reach and they bridge. You have to be that flexible and that nimble to be an arboreal mammal because you're, you're maneuvering and, and working in this complex three-dimensional environment with branches and vines and you know very different than just walking on flat ground like we do. So that's a great point. Mitigating loading on the proximal limb joints like the shoulder and the hip, they're able to do that with their digital flexors and their elbow flexors and their knee flexors. So that's where the majority of the force and the strength is concentrated in these animals. Okay, so. All very interesting. Cool. Fascinating stuff. Okay. So I guess, um, what can we do with this information now? So, okay. so kind of why, how, okay. how can we make, what's, what can we do that's useful from this? What can we learn that's useful okay. from this? Okay. So this is going to be, that, that isn't, you know, understanding how animals work in general right. Right. by itself is a worthy endeavor. Sure. You know what I mean? No, yeah. I, I know. I know. Trust me. I don't, I don't take offense to this question because I get this kind of question all the sure. time. Um, my stock answer is why does it matter? Right. <laughs> As you said, right. um, the structure and function of mammals, a sloth, a rodent, a horse, a dog, that's, in, that's important information to know because what I do is called fundamental science. And we take for granted things that we can read online in a textbook, in a magazine, a journal article, or what someone might teach us in a lecture. That's just knowledge. Well, where did that knowledge come from? It comes from scientists like me who do the scut work. It's all the behind the scenes, the inglorious stuff where we actually do the research, we work on the relationships, we understand what this piece of anatomy evolved for. So fundamentally, that is something I'm interested in. How did this evolve? How is the animal put together and how does it work? And there is a lot of value in knowing just that information. Now, if we wanted to take it one step further, I just mentioned that primates are, are absolutely capable of doing this type of, of locomotion as well. We are both primates. Mm -hmm. We have relatives that are great apes. We have relatives that are monkeys. Humans as a lineage come from an arboreal lineage. We descended trees. We evolved an upright limb posture. We became more economical at walking upright, which again is very strange and unusual in the mammalian world. But our, but our origins are arboreal. Would our ancestors have required similar types of structure and function to be able to do suspensory habits if necessary? Absolutely they would. But I will go even more fundamental than that. What set me off on this was I'm a person who's really interested in muscles and muscle physiology. And we often follow these rules because I, I teach about them. I read them in a textbook. These are human constructs that we have developed over, over a century now of studying how muscles are put together, how do they contract, what is their physiology. And what I've learned rather quickly is by studying other types of taxa besides domesticated animals or primates, muscles don't really play by a set of rules. They are, it's very adaptable tissue. It all depends on how the limb is organized. This bony process is short, this other bony process is long. Muscle fibers are long, muscle fibers are short. Some are at an angle, some are straight and parallel. One muscle has a really long tendon of insertion, the other one doesn't. One has a long in lever, but a shorter out lever. All these things related to mechanical advantage. This is all very much correlated with how the animal uses its limbs and uses its anatomy. So I'm really interested in the construction of limbs and how does an animal use its limbs to perform a behavior, digging, climbing, suspension, locomotion in general. 
That is probably the essence of my work. And anything that I learn about muscle tissue and its adaptability or its plasticity can be applied to any human question you might have. Most directly, people who are either biomechanical engineers would often look at material properties data. What are the properties of bone? And mammalian bone or vertebrate bone, turns out it's, it's really similar in terms of how strong is it, how stiff is it, how bendable is it, how, how compressible is it. So these properties are important. The properties of the muscles and the tendons are also important. How muscles contract, very important. And by the way, we've been studying them, as I said, for over a century. We still don't completely know how muscles contract. We haven't really worked out all those details. It's just something we assume and we take for granted. So when I study a system of any mammal that can do suspension, and I think, wow, I have to take what I know about upright mammals, turn it upside down, and then start right. working backwards from there and think, hmm, could an animal like this depend on only anaerobic muscle fibers? And an Yes. Wow, that's different. I would have never expected that from, a, from any mammal because energy conservation is so critical. But what we learn is there's not just one way to conserve energy. There are multiple permutations to do that. But these are not things that we thought muscles were even capable of doing because we want them to play by rules and they just don't do it. Animals and movement, it, it plays by a general set of rules, but there are multiple permutations and many things are just on a continuum. And that's what I find really interesting, having done now a number of studies with sloths. They will belie your hypothesis. They will, they will be the opposite of what you think and how they're doing what they're doing. And what that teaches me is, well, it isn't just sloths that are doing that. Other animals that do this type of locomotion are probably using the same type of mechanics or they might have muscles that have the same architecture or the same physiology well beyond what we ever thought was possible. And that's why I find suspension so fascinating. And I mean, we're just kind of scratching the surface with what we're doing, but now that we've done a lot of these fundamental studies on anatomy and the physiology of the bones and the muscles and the tendons, uh, we're working much more now on the locomotor mechanics, and, and we're essentially getting to the part where we're driving at just how much energy can these animals conserve by moving a specific way. Uh, using these type of, of limb kinematics, and do they keep their elbows more flexed? Do they keep their knees more extended? Are they exerting uh, medial force in the substrate, or are they pulling on the substrate? Are they using their forelimbs to propel themselves? Are their hind limbs being used to break themselves? So the dynamics of the center of mass, as we say, Mike, that determines how much energy is being used versus how much energy is being conserved. We've done this on a number of mammals. Most of them are what we think of as walking and running mammals, and they're upright. So we really know quite little about suspensory mammals and vertical climbing compared to upright walking and running. And by the right. way, sloths can also do terrestrial walking. It looks like they're crawling. But it goes well beyond what most people think they're capable of doing. They're, it turns out they're excellent at climbing. Of course, we know that they hang below branches and they walk below branches. It's the only way they can walk. They cannot run. They can walk on all fours, upright, although they can't really push their body high off the ground. They essentially crawl, like I mentioned. And they're excellent at swimming. <laughs> so sure. so, so yeah. this, is the, the, this is the final impression I want to leave on you. When you're assessing an animal's anatomy, usually you can tell is it a generalist like us, we're kind of a jack or jill of all trades, or is the animal specialized? And if, if it's specialized, that means it has evolved adaptations to do this one behavior very well. And it, it is likely not to do another behavior well, if another behavior at all. We're different, we're generalists. Sloths are very specialized. They're specialized to do suspension, and now we think climbing. The three-toed sloths may be more climbing than suspension. The two-toed sloths, more suspension than climbing. But you can take that same morphology, and you can co-opt it to swim. When would you ever think of an animal that looks gangly like that as a good swimmer? But it, they're quite capable of doing it. That fascinates me, how 
shared traits or overlapping traits can be used in a different way. So it's this, again, how is it put together? How does it work? That is what a biomechanist does. That is what an engineer does. That is what an auto engine mechanic does. I just do it with animals and anatomy. And right. that has a lot of usefulness and practicality for many things that humans would like to know or apply to us. The old question is, how does this make my life any better? Well, one, right. I taught you something. So I just shared a lot of knowledge with you that you might find interesting. But you can apply anything that I just mentioned with a sloth to what humans are capable of doing. But you will never be a sloth because you don't have the right anatomy, you don't have the right makeup, and your behavior isn't the same, nor is your, your ecological niche that you occupy the same. But that idea of how evolution can specialize animals to take advantage of resources in a specific niche, really fascinating, and my students always find this fascinating. I just wouldn't want to live off of leaves. Right, <laughs> yeah. Energy and energy conservation is a fundamental thread that's woven throughout evolution. And evolution is about efficiency and energy conservation. So cracking the code on sloths and how they do it, it's still something we're working on, but we've got a lot of interesting leads from all the work that we've done in my lab. And now I'm collaborating with another lab and, a, and another friend and collaborator, and we're gonna take it to that next level, looking at more of these locomotor dynamics and mechanical type of analyses to see are they doing things similar to other mammals that walk upright, or are they really driving their entire locomotion by muscle contraction and muscle work? And if they are, their muscles would have to be anaerobic. They'd have to be using the least amount of ATP possible per force of contraction to be able to do what they do. Sleeping a lot during the day helps. Sure. So if you, if you can take away a moral from a sloth, be your inner sloth. That means conserve energy, live life in the slow lane, live longer, right? Right. That's, that's essentially what they do. Excellence at Work is sponsored by Youngstown State University.